So good morning, everyone, and very much welcome to the Good Grief Festival um, and this particular session, My Endless Love. I'm Julia Samuel. I'm a psychotherapist and an author, and I'm very honoured to um, facilitate this session and introduce Charlene Lamb, um, who's going to tell you her story, and Jane Harris, who many of you may know already, who's going to talk about her story. And what we're going to talk about is how the relationship with someone who dies continues and evolves over time, where the absence of their presence, how we can create that into making something meaningful, because what we understand by continuing bonds, which was a kind of new theory back in the early 2000s, was this idea of a relationship ending um, when someone dies and that you forget and move on isn't how we are as human beings. And so it was a very mechanical model and people felt that maybe they were doing it wrong if they still continue talking to the person that died in their mind or did acts of love for them or had rituals for them. And Klaas Silverman and um, uh, Nickman developed this theory of continuing bonds, which is basically that um, we don't end in detachment when someone has died. Uh, but we, the love never dies, and it's how we find ways of continuing to feel that love, express that love, and in some ways develop and grow that love, despite the death of the person that we love. So first of all, I'd like to ask Charlene, do you want to tell us the story of how you, <laughs> how you got into this business, in a way, of the grief business? What is your story around that? Yes, thank you so much for having me and for joining us this morning. Um, like a lot of us, personal loss. Um, my mother died suddenly from a stroke in 2013. And I was working in London at the time. She lived in New York. I'm originally from New York. And when my mother died, she left a house, a dream house full of belongings. And I know this is a common experience where you're, suddenly you're confronted with having to decide what to do with all of the belongings. The stuff. And all the stuff. Oh, my goodness. And what happened was everything suddenly became precious. All of the souvenirs, all of the little toys and trinkets that I really hadn't thought about. Um, the soy sauce in her kitchen cabinet was suddenly so meaning. incredibly, yes, so emotionally tied. So I asked myself, how am I ever going to decide what to keep? And in London, I was working as an independent curator. Um, I was putting on exhibitions featuring the work of designers and makers. So in my desperation or inspiration, um, I put on my curator hat and I asked myself, Okay, if I was to do an exhibition about my mother, which 100 objects would I choose to display? And that was the creative question that got me out of paralysis. It got me to empty the house, but after selling the house, I did put on a physical exhibition. So it's yes. the lens, so that it's like when your mother died, all of her objects had significance because it was all that was left behind. She was no longer physically present. Yeah. And so her stuff became her in some ways. And then you yes. did get stuck in how, what do I, how do I decide? So as all of us in grief, it is very personal and unique. You used your experience and in your ways of being of curating it and then deciding the hundred most important objects, which is a bit like the exhibition with Neil McGregor, wasn't it? He did like a hundred um, objects. In fact, yes. yes. But we'll come um, back to you. I just yes. to say Nadia Ensink Tate was meant to be with us um, because her husband was murdered very tragically, but she's on her own journey and she's in Zimbabwe with her daughter. And um, part of her grieving is this journey, but also Zimbabwe, the, the Wi-Fi isn't very good. She's out in the jungle. So I think she's with us um, as a participant. So hi, Nadia. And I'm sorry that you're not on the panel with us, but do please be engaged. Um, but I, now I'd like to introduce Jane Harris, who's going to tell us 
um, your story. Yes, thank you, Julia. And so lovely to meet you, Charlene, as well. And sorry about your mother. Um, yes, well, I'll start right in the heart of the kind of matter, really. My son died very suddenly in 2011. And it was kind of like a bomb went off. Um, and you I mean, know, that's in itself such a, it's like everything got everything like nothing was left. In the air and lands differently. And of course I'm a therapist, so you know, you'd imagine I'd know what to do. Believe me, <laughs> you don't. You're immersed in the trauma and the shock. And so straight away, we realized that we were gonna have to find some way through it. Now we met, myself and Jimmy met at film school um and the first thing we realized was that to find some way of moving forward we we're going to have to find some way of saying goodbye to josh because he died in vietnam traveling on the trip of a lifetime i'd kind of let him go you know roots and wings i i'd kind of relax he's 22 he's great he's in good form he's happy my job is over as a mother and actually that's where the trauma set in so the first thing we realized was we're going to have to create a funeral for him to say goodbye to him and of course through lockdown this is something that people haven't been able to do and i really my heart goes out to everyone who hasn't had that opportunity of saying goodbye but that can i add the sort ritual. of take on that is exactly is that in you know the task of mourning is facing the reality of the death and that is you know how you you know your date your brain is a learning machine has to adjust to this new reality that for you was like a bomb that you couldn't make sense of that you couldn't take in all at once exactly. and so creating a ritual that in some way externalizes and marks the significance and the importance and the reality of his death was psychologically really really important that's right julia and i mean i'm i'm jewish i'm not religious but ritual is a huge part of my history um, and therefore ritual was going to be my way forward. And that's at a very primitive unconscious level, you know? So what we decided to do was to do what we could do rather than struggle with what we couldn't do. So we started with a film about his funeral, which has now been seen by thousands of people all over the world. It's really difficult to share that personal stuff, but we have, we're very lucky to have those kind of skills. My partner, Jimmy, my husband is a, is a BAFTA award-winning film editor. So we could do that. And as a therapist and as a filmmaker, we're both very curious about how people live their lives. But after the funeral was over, we were kind of thrown into this lonely place because the pressure on people once the funeral is over is to be who you were. And of course, as any mother or any person who's lost a child or someone in an untimely way knows, that's just the beginning. And you don't get over it. You don't get over it, but you learn to live with it. You have to integrate it in. And that's why this theme today is so fabulous. You know, continuing bonds, it's at the heart of my pulse. It's in, it's 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 what gives me meaning. Um, and the first film we made after Beyond Goodbye was called A Love That Never Dies. Well, I don't really need to give anyone here a clue as to why we called it A Love That Never Dies. It's in the title of the film. But what I found both as a therapist and as a bereaved mother was that there was an awful lot of pressure to get over it to be who I was and it didn't take me long to realize that that was about the discomfort of others and to begin with I tried to handle that and make it okay for others until I had that kind of awareness that light bulb moment I am not here to make it okay for others I'm here to try and find my way through and share my learning so a few years after we set up a charity called the Good Grief Project, which was looking at proactive ways of managing our grief, of using creative writing, filmmaking, photography, to help people to make meaning out of, I suppose, their broken hearts. And a lot of people had told us that, you know, they kind of wanted to die after the death of their child. Well, that's it's not- It's illogical, it's important, isn't it? You feel like your heart is, at, your heart is actually broken. Absolutely. Down. And so we realized that we were going to have to do some work, not only for other people, but also for ourselves to help people to understand that it was something really important about getting alongside the bereaved rather than expecting the bereaved to make it okay for you or avoiding them to actually, if you like, um, connect with them and try and be brave, try and deal with the silence, try and deal with the discomfort. And that is at the heart of the work we do. And of course, at the heart of the work that Julia does in her amazing writing. I love your book about families and how to survive. 
And it's not that's the John Cleese one, but every family has a story. Family. It's something I recommend to so many people. Thank you. But you know, the thing is, my background is psychodynamic, and I can't help but dig into the past. And this is why continuing bonds is so helpful to me because it helps me forward by looking at the past, by looking at my own history, by then integrating that. I can then, if you like, feel hopeful about the future and everything we do at the Good Grief Project is about finding hope because I can tell you, and this is not rocket science, every person who attends our grief retreats thinks they can't do it. They arrive saying, I can't do this. Well, it's like grief. When Josh died, the first thing I said was there are no words. That's the title of the book. I can't do it. My son, my beloved son, Josh, is dead. 11 years on, he's folded into my heart. I still feel the pain. In fact, right now, having just created this book, he's very much alive around me. He'd be laughing. His favorite word was mundane, and that meant he was excited. He'd be saying, Mom, this is so mundane. You're talking to these amazing people. You've written a book with Dad. But actually, this thing around continuing bonds is at the heart of hope. And thank goodness for the theories, the dual process model, all the theories that have helped us through and help our clients through. And validate um, your experience. Because otherwise, like Charlene, I guess when you started curating the objects in your mum's house, people might have looked at you and thought, hang on, soy sauce bottle, or what, you know, what, what are you mad? Are you is there is there something wrong with you? Do you have prolonged grief disorder? So how have you given yourself permission to validate your experience and navigate yes. your life? In the, in the presence of this new relationship with your mom and the objects that you've curated? Well, in grief, right, we cope however we can. So I do feel very lucky that I did have this creative outlet and this kind of creative instinct to lean on. And what I find so fascinating about the objects is it's so personal, what we attach to. So attaching to the soy sauce bottle, I had stories about meals that my mother had cooked, but of course the ties to my Chinese American heritage. There were so many attachments. I think of these belongings as anchor objects. Nice. Because yeah. they anchor these stories, right? And the meanings that we put on them. And with the grief gallery, there's an element of choosing how I want to remember my mother moving forward. So there were so many things in the house, but I think that's the beauty of giving ourselves that grief of, well, okay, if I was to choose, if I was to be a curator for this imaginary exhibition, how would I want one to remember my person? And how do I want them to be remembered by other people moving forward as I figure out how to go forward? So that was very helpful for me. And that's what I offer to everyone else too, that we are all curators after a loved one dies, mm -hmm. right? You don't need to be a professional to do this. So because your relationship with the person was so personal, embrace that. You get to be the curator. You get to choose what you put into that, that exhibition in memory of your person. And I love the agency and kind of creative power to move forward as you talk about that that gives you because one of the kind of devastating things of grief is this wall of the reality that there's nothing you can do this person that you love has died and Absolutely. So suddenly and out of your control and you hadn't you were completely powerless in that moment yes what I'm understanding from both of you actually is that by Kind of connecting with yourselves as you are it's like not reinventing a different version of yourself so people listening it's like keying into the things that interest you your 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 personality your experience your skills where your energy goes and harnessing that in order to create this new relationship and that that is how you find a way of curating your grief shaping your grief I mean all these words they have I think what I like about curating is that it's it feels much more solid and shaping can feel a bit flabby <laughs> and a bit yes. like <laughs> well, and curating. Yes. I mean, curating has a kind of substance, doesn't it? It's like a 
it has a bit more oomph to it. Oh, I just define curating as making intentional choices. Nice. Yeah, because I think when we sometimes when we think curator, we think, oh, you need to work at the Tate, you need to work at the v &A, yes. when really we are making intentional choices all the time. Maybe we don't have a gallery space, but we have a shelf, right? We have our framed photos on the wall, our artwork, and we're making those choices about what takes up space in our lives. But and we're where also we put our attention and what exactly. we want to take our attention. Exactly. And we choose the stories that we want to highlight and the memories we want to highlight about our loved ones as well. So to me, those, that's all the option to have intentional choice. Exactly as you said, Julia, when we're experiencing circumstances that we can't control, when we've been blindsided by the death of a loved one, we feel so helpless. So being able to have some sense of agency to recognize some of the choices we do have, I think can be immensely healing. And I think as Jane was saying too, and linking to Charlene, is that sometimes you can get this sort of positive psychology too much, this idea that, you know, once you've curated the objects of your mum's life or made a, you know, an album or like in Jane's case, made these films and these wonderful books, that you then you, you're, the kind of pain, you know, diminishes and you're over it. But actually, we're saying the reverse is that you do need to live in the present and live your life, but you can be blindsided by grief because of a smell. You know, for you, it might be smelling soy sauce. For um, Jane, it might be hearing someone say mundane. You know, hearing another teenager say mundane might just boof, hit you. So I wonder where that takes you, Jane. Well, you know, I think it's the cliches that are part of the problem and lovely the way you express that, Julia. But this idea of you'll get over it, it's the cliches that cause the trouble. It's the cliches that hurt the bereaved. And time and time again, my clients talk to me about this. I'm not doing well enough. I'm not progressing well enough. Failing. I'm not being quick enough. And I always kind of point as subtly as possible to the idea of openings rather than closure. Because, you know, when your child goes off to university for four years and they're out of sight, would you as a mother, a parent, a sibling, stop loving them or missing them? Of course not. So when my son Josh died, I knew then my love would never die, but I didn't know it would strengthen in many ways. I didn't know that in a that's way- That's kind of you there, strengthen. Do you want to say, because that's really a big no, thing. I, it hasn't lessened, it's strengthened. Well, I, I have been able to fold him in. It's, it's the theory is one thing, but as a bereaved parent, my theory is strengthened and maybe my insight is strengthened. I don't like the term post-traumatic growth, but in many ways, my Josh has taught me so much about what's important in life and death. And I have been able to, it's, it's like magical thinking, you know, he's here. Kind <laughs> of here. I'm not mad. There's a woman in our feature documentary, A Love That Never Dies, an amazing woman, and she's a very, very high profile. And when we filmed with her, there was a moment when she shouted up the stairs to her son, come for breakfast, breakfast ready. And she said, I do that because I want him and I need him and I need to be able to share it. And I said, but look, this film's going to go out to thousands of people. Are you sure you want me to share that? And she said, yes. Because my growth and learning is that I have to be authentic and I have to share that he's still there and I'm not crazy. And so in your, in, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. I want to hear, you know, you published this new book yesterday, When Words Are Not Enough, Creative Responses to Grief. What were the other, um, this lovely book, so what are the other ways so that we give people listening and watching one or it isn't just curating your grief or doing what you do, but there are so many variety and rich ways. Absolutely. So, you know, we are so honoured to have 13 other contributors to the book, artists, writers, extraordinary, ordinary people, you know, a real mix of people. But what is absolutely eye opening is that they all use in a way what they can to move forward. Now, some of the chapters are about artists who couldn't paint after the death of their child. 
and then they could they could find ways it's about what do you do with the void how do you fill that space so we have swimmers cold water swimmers who plunge into the sea like jimmy josh's dad you know that's how he connects with josh we have sophie pierce who's just bringing out a book next spring and she writes beautifully about how swimming and nature connect her we have remarkable artists who paint portraits of their children which are so abstract at times and so moving that I'm lost for words just looking at their work the book is a kind of integration of the ordinary you know one of our lovely contributors takes her daughter who died at a very young age takes her daughter's t-shirts and makes cushions out of them I'm just working with the fabric and remembering her daughter which is something she thought she couldn't do in the early stages, gives her great comfort. So the mix is really broad. We have a wood turner, a man who basically goes into the forest. Beautiful stories of how turning wooden bowls is his way of connecting with his daughter. Um, so moving. And, so and beautiful. And Charlene, I can he see you kind of nodding and feeling inspired. And... Yes. I guess you're kind of taking in the idea that there is no one way or right way and kind of what comes up for you when you hear this. Absolutely not. Because one, with clients, because I'm a grief coach as well, sometimes there's a lot of pressure that people put on themselves. Even as creatives, I've had people say, I, I so much want to create something, a photograph, a photography project in memory of my father, but I just can't they're not ready yet. So there's that encouragement. Um, that's partially why I like one, belongings and objects, everyday objects, there's less pressure on that, right? I have mm. my grandmother's pin cushion. That's so lovely. But so everyday. imbued with so many stories, right? Yes. My narrative storytelling, meaning making being. So a pin cushion Absolutely. Really tells a million stories. Yeah. Everyday object, I use it, I integrate it into my life. I feel like my grandmother is still kind of connected to me, even though oh. I lost her when I was very young. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a big fan of commissioning artwork. Because if you're not creative yourself, or it's just a bit too raw for you, I'm a big so fan of commissioning. Yes, the UK has so many talented designers and makers who do personal commissions. So one of the things I did was I had to sell my mother's house. I couldn't afford to keep it. And the way that I captured that was I commissioned a series of illustrations. I love me. And this is my mother's dream house. I told the illustrator about it and she captured the view of the lake, the view of the swans, the trees. And I no longer have the house, but I keep the memory of the house. And I've actually commissioned her to do a whole series of illustrating other things that I did yeah. keep and could not keep, but how I wanted to remember my mother. So that's an option as well. And, and what I call that is like touchstones to memory. So you don't need the object itself. You don't need the actual house or in some ways, it's not that you don't need, but the, the person is absent, but you can imbue objects, commissioned um, uh, pi pictures, drawings, creative things. And what Jane talked about in, in talks about in Words Are Not Enough, that take us fast track in our brains to the person. You know, our brains are learning machines and they like habit and they like predictability. So when we give experiences, meanings, um, connections in an object, we see them and before we have time to kind of stop ourselves, we're connected to the person. And that is so powerful and so stabilizing when part of the difficulty of grief is that longing and that yearning and that wanting. And what we need to manage it is to kind of stabilize and slow ourselves down. And when we feel that connection with them, then we can feel the love for them and that can kind of open us rather than the fear that can really send us into quite a difficult spiraling place. I no, can see you nodding, Jane. Like, I'm thinking about all the parents who come on our grief retreats and we ask them to bring a photograph of their child and they're always reluctant. 
to do so. Um, and it's hard enough for them to share that photo, to even show it to the group. Because it loses it's, it's, you don't want to share it too much, you don't want it to you don't want diminish. It's yours, it's private, yeah. it's, it's yeah. heartfelt, it's a betrayal. And over the weekend, what happens? It's like people's shoulders lower, they relax, they share their photos. And we tell them that we're going to run these small groups where they're going to create a new photo. They're going to carry their loved one forward in a new form. What we're talking about here is continuing bonds. We don't say that, obviously. And the, the parents say, it's not possible. What are you talking about? And I think they think we're crazy sometimes. But what happens is that these photographs are recreated over the space of a weekend into a new form. And through that creation of something new from the pain that is the loss of their child comes a sense of confidence and belief in self again. And the whole weekend is made up the of trust people. is the trust, trust. Isn't it? it's it's that's the right trust gets it's blown trust. away when you're grieving yeah. and the trust they have to trust us you know they arrive why should they trust us they don't know us they trust us over the weekend eventually to guide them to create a new photograph and a new image and what we do in the final part of the weekend on the sunday they've arrived on the friday on the Sunday, we take every photograph that's been created. And believe me, everyone creates a photograph, even though on arrival, they say, no way, not doing it. We don't bludgeon them into it, but they do it. And at the end, we put together, Jimmy actually puts together this incredible short film of all of their photographs linked together in a short AV. So lovely. Now, when you watch it, we sit together, every one of us, including my daughter who does the food, my son who does the boxing, Jimmy and all the other team, Good Grief team, we all sit together and we watch this and you can't hear a sound. It's absolutely breathtaking. And through watching and our healing, so healing. Healing, you can't do it, you know, it's, it's enabling, isn't it? And, yeah. and it gives and empowering. A, empowering. That's so moving. Um, we've got we've come to the kind of part of questions. So Liz has said, um, many of us who've lost loved ones feel they live on in more than just our hearts and their legacy, and have come to believe there is an afterlife in which they are very present and active. This belief has been a great support to me since the loss of my son, and it keeps me going. However, there seems to be a taboo around it in a way that puzzles me as there is no taboo around religion and a belief in a higher power. And these beliefs are socially ratified and respected. Can you discuss this weird disconnect? Charlene, should we start with you? Did I just say, this is Liz, she's in our book. Her son took ah. his life. Um, and that's a picture of her and her son. Oops, we're in mirror mode. Her paintings are beautiful. Beautiful, thank, thank you. Thank you, Liz, for asking. Charlene. Yes, thank you for that. Well, I think part of that touches on the human brain trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. It's not the same Liz. Oh, way. is it not? No, it's a different Welcome way. all the Liz's. Oh, welcome Liz. I'm sorry, Liz. I apologize. I'm sure Liz said she assumptions. was. <laughs> we make assumptions. Whoopsie. Yes, I think we're just trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. Yeah, that can't be made sense of. Yeah, I'm not religious. So for me, I do create my own stories. Um, we can think of them as myths. We can think of them as narratives. And my background is also as a journalist and as a writer. So to me, stories underpin all of it. I have stories about where my mom is now. She loved to travel. So I just like to imagine her traveling nice. different places. And she doesn't have to worry about luggage limits or security <laughs> line and that's my visual of it's where free. she is now yes that's and so I think that's part of that choice that ability to choose and some people don't like other people's narratives and I'm very much a you get to choose you get to be creative about it and you get to choose where you want to think your person is I'm going to hold on to my mom with her um, universal passport going around the world I love that and I and I think you know, we could all learn by allowing everybody's different stories without having to knock that other person's out. Like there isn't just one story or one way of doing these things or belief, you know, like Liz is saying that we, we allow it in religion and we allow it 
um, in that as a higher power, but then when it's around someone's experience and expression of their grief, somehow we we disallow it. And the more I think we can allow collective differences to have a narrative of its own and permission to ourselves and permission to each other to legitimize their experience, mm. their way of coping, then we would actually be less fractured and more connected and safer society than this thing of, you know, either or. And I think there's so much in what you're both saying about both and, not wrong one way or the wrong way, but, you know, finding your own way. Um, Jane, do you want to say your response to um, yeah. belief and how the religion and, and how some things are legitimised and some are not? Well, I think what's important here is, you know, what you're both saying is so helpful, but I think it's about difference really you know i'm non-religious jewish and it's a huge part of my cultural background you know there's no getting away from it so for liz you know it's about doing whatever feels right for her and the disconnect is always an issue but we have to fortify ourselves in the belief that whatever feels right for us you know it's like the stages of grief actually elizabeth kubler ross is brilliant you know but actually we've moved on in our sort of processing of that the stages come and go there's fluidity and flexibility. There's no right and wrong in this. So for Liz, it's doing whatever helps her. That's lovely. Yeah. Give yourself permission. Um, this is a question from Anom Anonymous. As Jane said at the start, although you may be an expert or professional, when death comes into your personal life, it still knocks you sideways. Nevertheless, both Jane and Charlene have used their professional skills to help them in their grief. Do you have any reassurance for those who don't think they have any such training or abilities to draw on? Can I just say, trust yourself, you do. I think one of the difficulties about grief is that we, we feel so powerless in the experience of grief. We diminish our own skills and agency and kind of uh, lose touch with who we are it kind of we can feel eviscerated by it so that um but anyhow that's my response Charlene do you want to say and then Jane yes absolutely there's hope there's possibility I just happen to lean on it my way but if as you're a human being with a human brain one of the lovely things that we've learned right in the last couple of decades is about neuroplasticity about how we're able to rewire our brains. And I think we're that's wired what, to adapt. Yes, we are wired to adapt. I mean, we see that with the way we cope with such this of this tremendous thing that's happened to us. But I think that's why I really enjoy this idea of having the artwork, of having the objects that we choose to have be in our lives. Because I kind of think of it as if we're thinking about continuing bonds and we're deciding what kind of relationship we want to have with our person moving forward. I feel very connected to my mother. I feel very connected to my grandmother. And by choosing what objects I keep there, it helps to strengthen the memories that I want to strengthen, right? With neural pathways, the more we tell that story, and Julia and Jane, as the medical professionals, you can update me and you know let me know if I'm explaining this correctly but my understanding is that with neural pathways the more we tell a certain story we strengthen that connection in our brains so when I see the illustration of my mother's house it strengthens that memory and I've also chosen how I want to interpret her house I choose the stories about how much she loved that house the memories of going home and being fed by her during the holidays. I don't emphasize the stories about feeling guilty that I would lived far away from her. I let go she of the regret. Yeah. Yes. I let go of the regretful stories, the painful stories. What I've chosen to highlight is the stories that reflect how I want to remember her. So I think in that way, we can rewire our brains in a that very pathway and it actually is a pathway the neural pathway the more we practice it the the stronger it is and the more we automatically go down that particular pathway yes Jane, help our you, brains <laughs> there are, our brains are amazing machines i must say jane have you got anything to add 
Well, I love this idea of, you know, basically remembering that necessarily it's not ne it's not necessarily about how our loved ones died. It's about how they lived. And this is an enduring oh, the death story, the life story. Well, that's right. And, you know, for a parent, I mean, for me, you know, to begin with, when you're in trauma and you cannot lose someone in an untimely way and not experience trauma, it, it, it's, it's at the heart of the work. But this question from the anonymous attendee is really important, you know. You have to trust yourself. Don't put professionals on pedestal. There are good professionals. There are mediocre professionals. There are okay professionals, but it's for you, the individual, to find out what works for you because therapy isn't about the model. It's about the relationship. Find someone you can relate to. And if you're not ready to do that, then maybe peer to peer support. There's fabulous groups out there like the Compassionate Friends who, you know, you can walk alongside with. You don't necessarily have to do therapy until you're ready for me therapy was an essential component of my recovery um but you know trust yourself and don't believe that therapists or professionals have the answers we are on a learning curve just like you so thanks for that brilliant question thank you yes they're all good questions um alan was saying some time ago there was a lady in a radio program who said that her mother had asked for her ashes to be spread in harrod's doorways <laughs> A reason was that she would then be carried on shoes to many different places, even other countries. I love this. The daughter did manage to do this. She must have kind of sprinkled it secretly. Um, and getting someone to engage the doorman while she did it, a unique way of dealing with them. Um, I love that. I, and I think that's a, an adaptation of what you're talking about is that the love never dies and you can travel and take it and let it have its own life. You know, I think because we are evolutionary wired to survive, we have such a negative bias about fear and about safety that we kind of constantly need to stay with what's familiar and the same. And I think what you two both recognize and the story, this lovely story of the woman in Harrods is that when we allow our creativity and new ideas and new ways of being, which we have to develop in order to survive the death of someone so significant and complete, as um, Jamie is saying, you know, death out of time, it tears up the rule book of life, how you rebuild your life and how you let yourself trust in life. In some ways, you have to let yourself be creative to do that because you have to shift everything in your in your being to trust in this new version of yourself, to be able to live in the present and live the life that you're actually living rather than holding on to the past, which is no longer the life that you have. Mm. And something about not being afraid of the word creative because creative can be taking a pebble off the beach and writing your child's name on it or your mother's name on it. Um, and that can really, you know, it can really move you and, and make you feel like you're doing something, but ashes, of course, that's a lovely story. Josh has just been to Kilimanjaro, somewhere he wanted. Charlene, you 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 scattered your your mum's ashes in multiple countries. Absolutely, yes, that was part of the plan. Um, had the funeral director put them in a whole bunch of little containers because I knew this would be the best way to keep her in my life. Every time I go to Paris, every time I go to Peru, every time I go to Hong Kong, I think, oh, my mum's here. Hey, mom. That's and some people make jewelry out of ashes, don't they? So they wear them and oh, so do you so want to Josh is here in my bracelet in, in a little bit of his ashes. We've taken him to Vietnam. Everywhere we go, he comes, and it's a kind of another ritual. You know, it's not complicated grief and it's not dysfunctional for anyone who's worried out there. You know, it's 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 another act of ritualizing something that's very important. Um, and for us, it was lovely. You know, we, we when we made a love that never dies, we filmed at the Grand Canyon. And there was a moment when his ashes were thrown into some of his ashes were thrown into the Grand Canyon. So Amazing. whatever works, don't be afraid. And I think that, that very much says what Alina is saying is it's, we are powerless about death itself, which is really true. That's inevitable. But we are not powerless when it comes to what we do with it. And I think, you know, one of the things the arrow hits us. And, and we have no choice that we feel kind of stabbed and broken. And it, like Jane was saying, people feel like I'm never going to survive this. I'm never going to be any different. I'm never going to be able to take a picture or use a picture. But actually people discover that what you then do with it. And I think 
one of the big things that you, you're doing by demonstrating what you do with your personal experience of grief and sharing it with others is enabling and facilitating others to dare to trust in themselves to find what their way is for them so it's like your role modeling like a mother does to a child from your experience to everybody else and I, and I guess in some ways that is growthful for you that you're not only remembering and honoring and your your the, your loved person is traveling with you and developing and growing but in reaching connecting with others there's something that it does for you that you feel that it gives you purpose and meaning should we end on that both of you just saying a couple of minutes on that purpose and meaning and altruism sure with this work with the grief gallery um, to Wendy's question, I did keep most of those hundred items and probably more, <laughs> um, the ones that I could fit in my suitcase to bring over across the ocean. Um, and I think there is that aspect of giving ourselves permission and grace. So now okay. I'm very ready to talk about my mother, right? I talk about her all the time. I show her objects in my gallery but I also invite people to bring in objects and tell me their stories. But I wouldn't have been ready to do that at the beginning. So I think there is that aspect of our relationships time. changing. My relationship with my mother has deepened over time. Okay. My relationship with her stuff has changed over time. So I do want to ask you to give yourself permission and grace to allow that. Um, that, you know, I sold her house a year and a half after she died. I did not clean out the storage unit until this year, eight years later. Gosh. And that storage unit had a lot of things in the category of too painful to deal with right now. Yeah, overwhelming. Yes, but that relationship changed too. Now I'm ready to let those go. So, so give yourself that grace. The grace to have permission to do it when you're ready. And Jane, we've only got a few minutes, I'm afraid. But if you want to say about connecting with others in the community and joining people to write the, when words are not enough, the book and the things that you do. Well, I guess it's about recognising, you know, as you so beautifully just expressed, the grace to, to give permission and not create rules. You know, at the end of the book, we have 10 pointers of things that help and suggestions of things that don't help you know there's gray boxes of theory within the book which we've we've simplified but it's really important you know just to avoid the cliches to get up close to what you fear most as a non-bereaved person i'm talking to non-bereaved people here though in fact to be honest we're all bereaved of something in some way or another right now but i think it's about courage it's the courage to confront what you fear most and what I hear from bereaved parents is that we represent people's worst nightmare. And actually, when people cross the road or go around, the, you know, do everything they can to avoid you, it's because they're terrified. It's not because they don't like you. But I would say to those people, it's for you to step up to your fear. It's not for the bereaved person to make it OK for you. So it's about embracing the discomfort that is grief. And we all know grief is bloody uncomfortable and as Julia points out time and time again it's hard hard work but it pays so we're coming to the end do you want to say where people can find you I saw Jimmy put a link to the film um in the chat but and, and the good grief festival this film will go on their good grief channel um so Charlene people can find you on Instagram yes. Yes, I'm on Instagram at curating underscore grief. And the grief gallery is at thegriefgallery.com. And from there, you can find previous exhibitions, as well as a link to my coaching approach that integrates this idea that we are all curators. And Jane, anyone who wants to be in touch with you, where do they find you? So they can go to our website, www.thegoodgriefproject.co.uk or our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram pages. And for the book, that's available via our publisher, Quickthorn, or anywhere that you, know, you, can, you can get the book. But most importantly, through the Good Grief Festival, who are offering a really nice discount. But it's been just so nice to be here and chat so comfortably and have a cup of tea. Yeah. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Jane. It's been a very meaningful, powerful conversation. Thank you for sharing what is most personal and making it public. Mm -hmm.
Um, for those that want to follow me, I'm at Julia Samuel MBE at, on Instagram. And my website is juliasamuel.co.uk. And my podcast is Therapy Works. So I hope you'll all stay in touch with Charlene, with Jane, with the Good Grief Festival and me, because it feels like in the kind of connection of our community and the understanding and the growing understanding of ourselves and each other, um, that is how we heal. It is in the end that love is how we survive and is the best medicine. And it felt like a very loving session. So thank you all very much and have a good Saturday. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.